Wonderful, great. Thank you all for attending. I see we have a lot of people here. We really appreciate you tuning in to hear about Jeff's uh, new publication, The Perfect Police State. Uh, we're really excited to hear from him today. Before we start the conversation, I wanted to quickly introduce um, Tech Congress and um, the organization where uh, uh, both Jeff and I have served as Congressional Innovation Fellows. Tech Congress is a technology policy fellowship on Capitol Hill, and it takes, um, uh, I apologize, something's stuck on here, um, that we, we take um, mid-career or advanced uh, technology professionals, and they spend one year shaping technology policy with relevant members um, of Congress. Uh, we are based at New America right now. And I will quickly introduce Jeff. Um, he's an award-winning correspondent. He is an author, a technologist, and he most recently published um, Samsung Rising, which was long listed for the 2020 Financial Times and McKinsey Business Book of the Year Award. He's a former correspondent at The Economist. He's a regular commentator in the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the New Republic. And he's a frequent guest on CNN, MSNBC, BBC, and Bloomberg. He's also a term member on the Council of Foreign Relations. And his newest book, The Perfect Police State, is an undercover odyssey into China's terrifying surveillance dystopia of the future. And I really enjoyed the book. Um, and so first of all, I wanted to to congratulate you on you and thank you for writing it and letting me read it before this talk. Jeff, um, I think it would be great if you could first tell everyone what the book is about before we go into questions and what led you to write it. Um, so I had spent a lot of time in, a, in this Western region of China called Xinjiang. Um, you know, as a technology reporter, I had uh, traveled through there. I had flown out from Beijing. Um, I had spent time in a town called Kashgar, which is not far from um, parts of Central Asia. And uh, what I observed there in my most recent trip in 2017 was just um, this, this, this all seeing terrifying surveillance state that I had never seen uh, anywhere else. My specialty is actually writing about authoritarian regimes. So I spent time in North Korea. Um, I covered the uh, genocide of Myanmar, you know, spent a lot of time in Vietnam, um, you know, other parts of China, Turkey, Russia, did the Trans-Siberian Railway, but of all the you know authoritarian nations, I've I've tried to go inside and tried to document. Um, I just found that this region of Xinjiang was so terrifying because uh, it's it's as if you know when you go to other places, when you go to North Korea, you are um, you're slinging back into the past. You feel like you're going back into the Cold War to this Soviet dynasty, and there are the you know kooky goose stepping soldiers, and you know it's intended to look scary, but it looks a little bit goofy in so many ways. But when you go to Xinjiang, um, it, is, it is just an all pervasive, all seeing artificial intelligence, facial recognition driven, um, you know, concentra concentration camp populated police state. Um, and just the, the efficiency and, you know, the, the, sinister, the sinister efficiency with which the Chinese Communist Party has perfected this police state you know, just really um, terrified me. I, I also had a lot of friends there from the Uyghur ethnic group who, you know, who populate this region. There are about uh, 12 million of them. And when I started writing the book, um, about, uh, about 1.8 million people um, had been taken away to a network of hundreds of concentration camps. This, is, this was happening as I was writing. Um, these numbers were continuing to swell. The situation was starting to get more and more out of control as I was writing it. Um, but eventually, these uh, concentration camps, uh, they started, they, they housed about one tenth of uh, the population of this region of, of the ethnic minority population. So, you know, imagine, you know, if one, if, if here in America, one in every 10 of your friends, uh, you know, disappeared, went to a concentration camp where, you know, they were tortured and, and brainwashed and forced to undergo political propaganda training. So I set out to write this book um, because I knew that this is a story that needs to be told. It has uh, huge implications, not just for China and the Uyghur people, but really for humanity, because it is a worst case scenario in what technology can do when placed in the wrong hands, when not governed properly, and when used for, you know, nefarious uh, racist means. I, I really wanted this to, you know, not just be a story about China, but a warning 
a, uh, a story about, um, you know, like how we also use uh, predictive policing programs and various police technologies in America. What does it mean to use them? How do we govern them? How do we manage them to ensure that they're justly and fairly used? And this book is really, you know, diving into the underbelly, just the, the worst case, the George Orwell 1984 outcome in which technology controls all our lives in terrible ways. Great. So before we get into the technology piece, I am curious how you became a foreign correspondent to begin with, and in particular, how you focused on technology throughout your career. Yes, so I graduated back in 2008, went to the George Washington University out here in DC. Um, and my first assignment, so I was actually an anthropology student and I had uh, traveled out to Cambodia. I was doing anthropology research near the end of my studies. Um, I, I fell in love with Cambodia. Um, you know, I, it was a, a place that always, that, that just always attracted me. And as I finished up my anthropology research, um, it just so happened that the uh, a genocide tribunal was starting. This was the genocide tribunal of uh, one of the greatest mass murderers in history, a man named Doik, uh, who had run one of the major torture centers in Phnom Penh. So um, I began writing for a number of publications. Uh, I, uh, I spent time, there was an old publication called the Far Eastern Economic Review, which no longer exists. I covered this for them. Um, you know, I, went, I, I went to the, the Economist for a while as a, a Southeast Asia writer. Um, and I really built a specialty over time as, um, as a reporter who looks at some of the atrocities, looks at, tries to get inside the minds of some of the people, you know, who, who commit these, these genocidal acts. You know, what, what is it, you know, how is it that a man, and in this case, Doik, you know, a former math teacher at a, at a high school who was a volunteer for World Vision at one point, the, the Christian aid nonprofit, you know, how does this man also happen to be a mass killer? So, um, uh, so, you know, I continued this beat. I was on the, you know, I was on the North Korea beat for a long time. I, you know, spent time in Turkey. Um, and one of the things I found on this beat was that there was, you know, a, as Americans were having this discussion, um, you know, about a decade ago about, you know, the rise of big tech and, you know, the four horsemen, Facebook, Amazon, um, Apple and all those companies, their role in our society, their emerging influence over our government and politics. Uh, there were similar movements happening in other parts of the world that I was watching, um, one of which was China in particular, where uh, China was also having the emergence of this. So it was sort of a, a government, a state government, um, you know, business nexus that was just, you know, deploying some of these new technologies. The, the difference being that in China, these technologies were being deployed under a strictly authoritarian one-party um, government. Uh, so I wanted to dive in and, and cover more about the inter cover more the intersection of um, of government and technology, um, the intersection of uh, you know what what does it mean to be either a, a democratic leader or an authoritarian leader, and when you're when you're given a set of new tools that humanity has never really seen before. I think AI is a great example. Um, how do you make decisions over how to deploy this tech and who is watching you, who's watching the watchers? Um, and you know, how do you write, say, good laws, good policies to ensure that the technology is being deployed appropriately? And that's what brought me to this beat. So I'm a, a tech and authoritarianism writer. You could call it that. Great. Um, I, I really love that in the book, you kind of thread together a number of narratives um, from different characters. Could you tell us a little bit about them, how you came to know them, and then sort of what role they play throughout the book and in the narrative that you're trying to tell? Yes. So, you know, I think that as technology writers, uh, we run a risk of getting too absorbed in the tech itself, in the software and the hardware and how it's made. Um, and I very wanted, I very much wanted this book to be a human book. You know, this is a book um, that doesn't just explore, you know, the the political side of the technology and how it's being deployed in Xinjiang, but how it shapes and you know even at times erases the psychology of the people who are being surveilled. Um, one of the uh, chief protagonists who I met was a young woman named Mason, that's a pseudonym. Um, I, and I do use pseudonyms sometime because, sometimes because for good reasons, you know, there are people 
there are family members in this region, you know, who are still in danger from refugees uh, talking out to the media. So Mason um, was a young woman in her kind of mid to late 20s when I met her. And she um, was actually from an elite family. So she was from a, a respected family um, that had access to the, Chinese, to the Chinese Communist Party that was considered um, you know, one of the families that you know, would not be targeted under a mass surveillance system. She was of the Uyghur ethnicity, a secular Muslim. Um, she had uh, this deep love instilled by her family of reading and poetry, books, literature, and um, you know, this is very sophisticated literature. I mean, she she could read anything from um, say like George Orwell to the you know, to the recent history or Jane Austen. She was a big Jane Austen fan, um, but everything back to ancient uh, Greek and Persian epics. And you know, the, the whole region of Xinjiang has um, a long, colorful, beautiful history of of engaging in the storytelling of epics and, and poetry in, in an oral fashion. And so, you know, she came from this tradition. Um, she uh, was, you know, one of the top people in her high school, tapped to become a diplomat, um, attended a very good university in Beijing, the capital, and uh, went, also went to graduate school out in the Middle East in Turkey. She wanted to uh, study international relations and return home. And, you know, she would be this bright young, the bright young star of the Communist Party. But um, over time, the, um, the, the surveillance state in, in Western China uh, began um, getting more and more intense. There were a series of terrorist attacks and there were some protests many years ago in 2009 that prompted the Communist Party to, um, you know, to, to change course and to, um, you know, to, to announce that it was essentially gonna do a, a, a dragnet of the region and to, you know, was going to start treating more and more people as potential enemies. I mean, people, young men in particular were targeted, young men with beards in particular, you know, because beards are a, um, a Muslim symbol. Um, and uh, they were targeted, they were, you know, often taken away, they were beaten with rifle butts, you know, many were arrested. Um, there was a campaign in the early 2000s that started getting more intense. And Mason, who was overseas in Turkey, returned home every summer and observed just the effect that the growing surveillance state had on the people of her hometown Kashgar, of, you know, the, her friends and family. Um, she saw the, uh, the tactics that the Communist Party used to divide and conquer, to, you know, to treat everyone as a potential target who's being surveilled, and then in the process to turn them against each other, to, you know, to, to convince them that, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us, and your neighbor, you know, might be with us, and your neighbor might snitch on you for supposedly being against us, so you better, you know, get, get on the same page and, and watch your neighbors and, you know, make sure that they're in line with the Communist Party, too. So it really became a society for a long time where everyone was watching everyone. Where it got terrifying for Mason was when um, this old school surveillance, uh, you know, human surveillance network uh, started escalating into a, 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 a massive uh, artificial intelligence driven uh, dragnet. And it was called uh, the IGOP, the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. This was uh, a massive system that uh, the authorities there set up um, in which they would put in data on every citizen uh, using surveillance cameras, monitoring what they buy, you know, how they act in public, do they go through the front door, the back door of their homes, you know, like what are their mannerisms, what religion do they come from, did they go get to work on time in the morning, were they, you know, did they check in, did they get sick one day, like literally just everything that they could gather and this artificial intelligence system um, began trying to make predictions about every citizen and declaring who was likely to commit a crime in the future, and in particular, a, a crime of the terrorist nature, the you know the jihadi terrorist nature. Now, um, Mason, because uh, she was uh, you know at home, uh, you know she was at home and she was at coffee shops and tea shops. Um, you know, reading books a lot um, because she was traveling overseas to Turkey, uh, one of the sensitive countries in this region because of the affiliation, the association, uh, you know, with, with supposed terrorist violence by the Chinese authorities. Uh, she was in 2016, um, very suddenly, suddenly, but over time, she didn't see it coming, but it, it did happen kind of suddenly. Uh, she was labeled an enemy of the state, um, first taken to indoctrination lessons for a, a number of hours every day. Um, and then within, and, and then she was brought to a, a more intense uh, security compound where she would study 
for even more hours a day. And then within a day of being brought to this more intense center, um, she was summoned to an actual concentration camp or a detention center, as they're often called. Uh, she spent um, very lucky. Uh, so she was very lucky. She spent um, some time in this camp uh, just before things got a lot worse. And um, you know, using her intelligence and her wit, she was able to figure out some of the inner workings and some of the weaknesses of the system. And she gained the system um, to find a way out with the help of her family. Um, there were lots of, uh, you know, so, you know, one of the ironies of, I call it the perfect police state, but one of the ironies of the perfect police state is that it's very much imperfect and it's arbitrary. And, you know, it, it's like, if, if you are, um, if you are someone who is, you know, being targeted, like you don't totally know why always. And she was able to use that to her advantage because she found holes where it's like even the authorities didn't totally know why she was there. It turned out she wasn't properly in one of their systems to be registered at the camp. And, you know, using some of this knowledge and, and her family's connections, she, she was able to get out um, literally just before the whole region went on lockdown. She escaped um, through a very complicated escape route with the brave help of many people um, and now lives in Turkey. Um, so she, uh, it's just a harrowing story, but um, along the way she documented in particular many of the psychological effects of um, Jeff, I think we lost you again. I don't know if you're back. Um, you can't hear, I, I the book does document the psychological impact of this survey. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So uh, I don't know what's going on with my connection today, but uh, you know, so um, so she does. So she does document the the psychological effects of you know what it you know what what it what what it does to your psyche and your mindset to be in this system. And you know, I, I wanted to tell her story, and she wanted to tell her story. In the end, originally she didn't want to um, because you know, she wanted to kind of go inside herself and rediscover, you know, what had happened to her and, you know, what it was like to be in a camp where you're constantly being indoctrinated to have sort of your, your psyche erased and your memory erased, your, your sense of heritage and history and identity to, to have it erased and how to escape a camp and then to reconstruct, um, you know, to kind of reconstruct her identity, to remember that she is a Uyghur and that, you know, she did get out and, you know, there is hope for her and you know there is potentially hope for the Uyghur people so that's what um, the protagonist story is about in this book. It's great I, I was struck by how much she thought about the technology um, observing her even more so than the people that were committing these um, essentially crimes uh, against her and her her people throughout the book you you chronicle that, but you also talk about the China's acquisition of various surveillance technologies, uh, their accelerated efforts in AI in particular after the after Google created um, DeepMind and the defeat of the chess champion Lee Sedol by AlphaGo, um, and during you know between the period of 1997 and 2017, in 2017 China announced its national AI strategy but its global share of research papers in the field of AI increased from about like 4% to almost 30% of all the research papers on AI. They're a leader in AI patents. Um, they currently have around roughly 1,200 AI firms compared to about 2,000 AI firms in the United States. But it's still largely accepted that the US leads the world in AI technology development but that China also has some advantages, both in terms of its talent pool and computer science and engineering and its ability to capture and process large amounts of data. And you touch on that in the book. Um, an example of their access to, to data found in Didi, the Chinese version of Uber, and it processes more than 70 terabytes of data with 9 billion routes being planned a day and 1000 car requests a second. Um, yet, as you just kind of pointed out, and then you also say in the code of the book, despite all of their sophisticated surveillance technology, they, China failed to identify COVID-19 in a timely manner with devastating global results, obviously failed to keep her from escaping. So what is your view on China's AI capabilities and their ability to further develop the technology and put in place the right incentives for major breakthroughs, which is some you know, experts 
suggest that they don't have the right incentives like we have in free societies, open societies, because as you know, AI is um, most effectively done with open research. So I'm curious in a closed society and in some of these spaces, how you, how you see China's AI capabilities currently and then how it will develop in the future. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think it is widely accepted that America does lead in AI. Um, you know, there is, um, China does have a vibrant AI scene. It, it, this is something that I document in the book, that sort of the creation of um, China's AI uh, ecosystem through through firms and laboratories like Microsoft Research Asia, which is very influential over there. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, I think that as I've documented in some of my interviews in this book with uh, the technology workers from Xinjiang, Uyghur technology workers who were involved in creating the surveillance state, I think that there is a huge problem in China with that old adage of uh, garbage in, garbage out. You know, that if you put in bad data or arbitrary data that maybe doesn't really make sense, then you're going to get bad outputs. You're going to get bad, um, you know, advice from whatever system you're using. That that is, I think, the the catastrophe um, of what's happening um, in China right now with people's human rights. So you know, I'm sure the Chinese surveillance state, you know, it does it has gathered a lot of data on a lot of people, um, but we don't totally understand, you know, how it gathers that data. And you know, how does it use that data to train the algorithms? I mean, from, from what I can glean from my interviews, the algorithms that um, have been used in Xinjiang are actually quite crude. They're not, um, you know, they're not at the level of sophistication that you would find at a place like Amazon, you know, or, um, you know, or even Alibaba and a, a Chinese um, you know, online seller. Like th this, I, I think that the algorithms, um, I think that there is, a good deal of evidence, you know, from a mixture of testimony, but also some of the, um, just some of the software that has, you know, come out of China that, you know, I've actually tried before. It, you know, it, it's it's not really built necessarily for, um, you know, a quality um, a quality output or a quality kind of, you know, like like a quality uh, AI system that can kind of that can go across data and, and piece together things on its own without a human hand. Um, so this is why out in Xinjiang, there will be um, arrests, there will be, uh, you know, people taken to camps for silly reasons, like you, you know, you were late to work today, you were two hours late, where were you? Well, clearly, you know, so the police will get a, it's called a, a bump on their phone or a notification, you know, that says there's something suspicious about this person, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Smith is, he's been late for work two days in a row, Maybe you should go check on him, knock on the door, ask the neighbors what's going on. And then, you know, if, if like put the data back in, like report back to the system and we'll tell you whether or not to take this person to a concentration camp. And, you know, like if they're in a camp, um, that essentially means that the, you know, the state has determined them to be enemies, absolute enemies, and that they need to be completely purged of their, you know, their thinking and their thoughts and the, and and what the government calls the ideological viruses of the mind. They use all this kind of medical language to science language to describe what they're doing operating on the mind. Um, so, you know, I, I think that that is really the major failure of AI in China. Um, but I think that that is what ironically makes um, the Chinese state so, so strong in so many ways and so, um, so feared by so many people in China. Um, it's because nobody knows for sure you know, what the system is going to decide against them. It's arbitrary. Um, you know, if, if the system were too perfect, then, uh, you know, people would probably be able to figure out what the parameters are, what the criteria are, you know, why are they going to be sent to a camp and they can alter their behavior to, you know, to not be sent to a camp. But here, it's simply, you know, for whatever reason, the system decides you're going to a camp and we don't know why and that's why people, you know, just just living in that constant state of uncertainty, it just it cr it crushes the psychology of so many people in Xinjiang. It really it just makes them, you know, fearful every day for their life. Is this going to be the last day I see my family, my kids, my spouse, my, uh, you know, my partner? Um, that like that is the irony of this perfect police state. That it's perfect from its imperfection. Fascinating. So I have a two part question for this one. Um, I'm sure you saw the New York Times and ProPublica recently published a report on widespread, um, what they claimed were widespread online propaganda campaigns to counter former Secretary Pompeo's assertion that a genocide was occurring in Xinjiang. Um, 
when I was working on the Hill, we looked at a lot of what Facebook calls coordinated and authentic behavior, um, or what we called the artificial amplification, and the various technical efforts that make narratives look organic and widespread and essentially make it seem as if there's an audience that isn't necessarily there, sometimes it's called perception hacking. Um, that's the type of behavior that, that this article and this research was documenting. Um, these campaigns, as they point out in these articles, rely on technologies that are um, US, US technologies um, like YouTube and Twitter. They sometimes start in, on websites in China and then migrate onto um, US uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. And they're not always easy to spot or amplify. Um, it's not always easy to spot as they're being amplified. My first question is, do you have any thoughts on how US tech companies should respond to these behaviors or what obligations they have to marginalize and oppress communities like the Uyghurs? Um, and then secondly, I, on my own, went down into a rabbit hole a lot of these videos and um, you find English speakers and others who argue that the US sanctions efforts and efforts to you know, label what's happening in Xinjiang um, as crimes against humanity or genocide you see them saying that it's simply an effort to control a region with, you know, 12 million people that would otherwise be impoverished without the changes and developments that have made in Xinjiang. The argument is that the United States wants to kneecap China uh, from succeeding, essentially, and not that it cares about concentration camps or, of course, Uyghur labor and supply chains. Um, and you even highlighted the U.S. role in China's oppression of the Uyghurs based on mistakes made in, during the war on terror and U.S. De designation of Uyghurs as a terrorist organization. So what are your thoughts on those arguments that the U.S. wants to handicap the region economically as well as those are being propagated on U.S. technology platforms? Um, so I don't, I, so I, so yes, there's a lot to that question and I'll, I'll take it piece by piece. Um, so yes, you know, it, it, we do live in a real politic world now with these, these trade wars and, you know, what's happening with China. I think that, uh, you know, no one denies anymore that China is a, a major strategic rival and that, you know, it will continue to be as long as it grows. Um, you know, I think it's only natural for two, you know, giant powers, you know, one emerging power and one, uh, you know, one incumbent power to, you know, to have this sort of rivalry and this rivalry also plays out in the world of technology. Um, so yes, I mean, like, I, I don't think that, you know, what's happening right now is entirely, uh, you know, with these trade wars and, you know, trying to handicap Huawei and, uh, and other companies. I do think that there is an element of, uh, you know, real politic and, and, you know, just looking for ways to, you know, to make sure that America keeps a competitive edge. I think that these do play into, you know, major strategic policy decisions in the U.S., um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think that that erases, you know, the fact that, um, you know, there are uh, crimes against humanity and, you know, major uh, human rights abuses happening in China, um, perhaps on a scale that we haven't seen in this century. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, there are no uh, Nazi death camps. We're not, you know, like China is not gassing the Uyghurs. It's not, you know, setting up mass graves. Um, but, uh, you know, what is so terrifying about this particular um, crime against humanity is that it's it's a it's a postmodern um, version of what happened in the, in the 20th century. It's not China has found a way to you know erase a people's identity and population through more subtle means and slower means. You know, and using with the help of some of these technologies. One great example is uh, the use of forced uh, sterilizations and birth control, which under international law is you know one of the um, major markers uh, that would that would be used to determine whether this was a genocide. There was actually a report, I mean, we can go beyond, so the State Department and a few of parliaments out there have declared uh, this a genocide, but um, even among independent academic experts, uh, I could, I don't have this report handy, but um, a group of them published a major report a couple of months ago that went through inter, um, the UN and international law and uh, showed why actually this would meet the threshold for um, genocide. Now, you know, America does not have a wonderful sparkling history of responding to genocides around the world. I think that, you know, as we've seen in Rwanda and Cambodia um, and, you know, even Nazi Germany early on before, you know, but before um, the, the war started getting worse and worse, um, that, you know, America and its policymakers and leaders have wanted to close their eyes because when you use the G word, that means that you have to do something about it. And, you know, there's even with the um, Rwandan genocide, there are even declassified documents now that show, uh, you know, military officials in the U.S. saying, 
like, don't call it a genocide because then you might have to do something. And that's as close to the original quote I can get. I'm paraphrasing, but it's just, it's just truly um, shocking. So, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, like, I, I think that to so the question you're asking, there are lots of these very complicated angles. And I think that, you know, what the US does, the US does not, um, you know, always act out of the kindness of its heart to the world, you know, going uh, to, you know, to China and condemning the treatment of the Uyghurs. I mean, I think we also saw in John Bolton's uh, memoir, he mentioned this briefly that, um, you know, that the, the Uyghur human rights issue was kind of seen as one of the chips on the bargaining table. You know, it's like you can use that to get leverage and negotiate in trade negotiations against China. Human rights is always tied to trade. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the question you're asking, like, it, it depends on, I guess, you know, which government you're asking, which leader you're asking, which policymaker, you know, some of them, like maybe Samantha Power are more um, focused on the idealistic side of policy and the humanitarian intervention for purely, um, you know, altruistic reasons, whereas, you know, you go to the, the Bolton side, and it's, you know, these are the chips on the table, you know, put human rights there, and, you know, make sure that, you uh, you know, that we can advance American interests as, as they should be. To your point about um, Bolton, in the book you noticed, you noted that he said uh, that President Trump didn't care about the, the camps and in fact told President Xi, go ahead, you know, build the camps however you want at the time um, in, that, in, the, in their summit. And then by the end of the administration, you have this declaration of genocide, um, which as we could discuss further is very complicated. I'm, I'm curious if you could talk a, a little bit more about that arc of change going from, sure, go ahead, do what you need to do. I know a lot of it had to do with the trade wars um, to labeling a genocide before they left office. Could you talk a little bit more about that transition? Sure, so uh, actually, the, the, so I, I spent a lot of time covering some of these uh, trade wars back when they were just starting. And I just remember, uh, you know, very just vividly when the Trump administration had entered office, you know, some of the, uh, the, the virulent rhetoric against China. I mean, it was like, you know, he would be on the campaign trail and China's the boogeyman. And there were the funny YouTube videos of him saying, you know, China over and over a zillion times to like rap music. It was kind of funny. And, you know, back then, I mean, I, we all knew journalists, uh, policymakers, people in this sphere. We all knew that um, you know China uh, was not going to become more democratic. That you know there there wasn't really hope anymore. That you know the government was going to open up or maybe take a, a friendlier, more amicable stance to America. Um, but then you know President Trump came in, and I think he really upped the ante, and he actually you know brought China from you know something a little maybe more on the side of of policy circles to something that's the centerpiece. Everyone in Washington is talking about it, you know, and like under under President Trump, I remember kind of there was this thing that happened where everyone, everyone in Washington DC was a, like kind of now an expert on China and like everyone was, uh, you know, giving their hot takes on China and social media and everywhere. Um, but, um, you know, that at the beginning, that was very much a, um, you know, that, that was very much kind of a, a, I guess, a blunt object, you know, it felt more like um, rhetoric and, you know, it was, it was yelling and, you know, one upmanship who, you know, President Xi would say his own things that were equally kind of blunt against America, you know, he would say it to Chinese audiences usually. Um, and, you know, I think that there was a transformation over time, uh, you know, as his administration, um, you know, ch changed very rapidly with its huge turnover, um, and I think that, uh, you know, there were some figures in the White House, especially in the National Security Council, um, who did, uh, and, and this is, I mean, this is like, these, this is from interviews I've done with them. So this is not my speculation. This is, you know, what they say, um, who actually did um, care, who were following the situation of the Uyghurs, who were, were following the human rights side too, um, and began urging the presidency to incorporate that, you know, in this kind of blunt foreign policy. So these, these forces, of you know, trade wars plus um, human rights and the Uyghurs and Tibet. Um, I, I think that we saw a convergence over the period of the Trump administration. And now we're in, you know, it, like I, I don't think much has changed. Um, I think that we're really now in part two, which is President Biden. And we're seeing the same convergence of trade considerations with human rights considerations that were not really as strong before. Great, thank you. Well, why don't we, um, try and turn to the audience for a few questions before I keep pestering you with other questions. 
We have um, one from, uh, so I'm asking about government issued digital currencies and the author is concerned that they will replace cash and digital IDs and will be woven into everyday aspects of life and not just in China and primarily concerned about the anonymity um, online could disappear. And the question is, will any country resist the temptation to design digital currencies and digital ID systems for surveillance and not privacy? What is the counter pressure? So, um, so the question is just to clarify, so essentially about uh, Bitcoin and uh, whether these currencies will, are you asking whether they will converge with, um, I guess, with regular markets with respect to China? I think so. I believe that's what they're asking. Yeah. So actually, um, to be totally frank, I haven't been following the recent uh, Bitcoin saga with China um, as much. I've actually been a little more involved. I, I've just been, you know, busy uh, getting this book out. So I, I, I kind of had a, a blank space where I, I know that Bitcoin's getting really big in China right now, but I just don't know as much as I should about that topic. Um, you know, I, I, there is, uh, I can talk about, um, there is the whole Xinjiang element. I mean, a lot of Bitcoin is mined and produced in this region. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, like, I, I think that it's always surprising, you know, just going back to, to the perfect police state and what's happening with the Uyghurs, it's always surprising how this region of China seems a bit far off and uh, remote. Um, but then, uh, you know, so many um, industries are are manufactured there. I mean, there, there's Bitcoin, um, you know, a major uh, producer of Bitcoin, which is uh, terrible for the environment and that, you know, just uses up so much energy in Xinjiang. But then also this region is a, a major oil power. Uh, I mean, it, it, it produces, a, it has huge am amounts of oil reserves and, and minerals um, and various, um, uh, uh, various uh, rare earth metals, um, strategic you know, industries for the 21st century, um, for 21st century geopolitics. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, I, I, like, I, I just think, so, like, whatever China is doing with Bitcoin, um, like, I, I don't really, I don't fully grasp yet what its strategy actually is in the long run. I, I don't understand quite yet whether um, China is simply trying to rein back Rain back control back to its actual currency and not allowing people to, you know, launder money through Bitcoin or whatever it may be. I mean, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin based money laundering is a massive problem in China. But, um, you know, that's something I just I feel that this this recent Bitcoin news in China, it's it's a it's kind of recent and I, I just haven't had a lot of time to process it and to figure out talk to people and kind of figure out what's really going on behind the scenes. Great, thank you. Um, so another question was, how much time did you spend in that region of China and how many people did you interview? Were you able to gather official reports, photos, et cetera? It's another audience question. Yes to all. So um, my most recent trip to the region was to Kashgar, which is the heartland of the Uyghurs in December, 2017. Um, I was told in no uncertain way that uh, I'm not welcome back there, so please don't return. You don't want to know what happens then. Um, so I haven't gone back, and I've instead been based in Turkey mainly and also out here in Washington, D.C., um, where a lot of my um, interviews come from recent refugees. So, you know, refugees who have left in the, in the years mainly 2016 and 17, which is really the I would say really the final wave um, of people who were able to escape before you know the the passports were taken and the lockdowns happened. Um, so in total, I interviewed about 168 people who were um, not just Uyghurs but also Kazakhs and you know Kyrgyz people from other groups, the Kyrgyz group, um, you know Uzbeks, uh, people in Turkey too who work on human rights uh, issues related to Xinjiang. Um, and then on top of that, um, I, I interviewed a number of government, uh, former government officials. Uh, there was one intelligence officer who had defected, um, who was actually shot twice in the back, survived um, in Turkey because of his defection and because of the fact that he was trying to leak state secrets to various media outlets. Um, also, um, you know, in interviewing some of these insiders, I interviewed uh, some of the, the, the technology workers and spent a lot of time with them who were actually working to build the surveillance state. And one of them is a character who appears named Irfan, um, who was involved in kind of putting together this, this piecemeal AI system that watches everyone. 
Um, and, you know, in interviewing them, they provided official documentation, they provided the leaks. Um, I had also received a lot of official CCP um, government documents that were leaked through other sources that were kind of going around. Um, other journalists had gotten these too. There were the Xinjiang papers published in the New York Times. Uh, there was the, uh, um, the ICIJ papers. I mean, there, there were a number of leaks that proved this, but then um, on top of the interviews that I did, um, we, you know, me and my team, uh, we, we spent just um, years going out, uh, just going around the Chinese language internet, uh, gathering pro procurement documents and, uh, you know, various official documents and press releases and official media reports that, um, you know, that's, that in very specific terms described what was happening and described um, you know, how a camp was being built and, you know, the, the supplies that they needed, the materials they needed from contractors and, you know, how, like, how do you build a watchtower and, you know, how many people are going to be surveilled in this region or that region and which companies are involved. Um, some American companies appeared in this documentation and this is now well known. I mean, one example is Thermo Fisher, which does, um, you know, biometric, a uh, major scientific firm in America that does biometric gathering um, that has pulled out of Xinjiang since then, but, you know, was found to be deeply embedded in, in this, um, this system of DNA collection of, you know, um, uh, not, just DNA, not just DNA collection, but um, DNA collection without uh, consent uh, of, of people so they could be put in a database and surveilled, you know, with their, their genetic makeup um, too. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the things I tried to do with this book was to make it as exhaustive as possible and provable as possible um, with, you know, what is now available. But, uh, you know, my book, it's, I, I don't intend it to be the exhaustive final word on everything that's happening in Xinjiang. I think there's still a lot more that's going to come out. Um, the region is on more and more lockdown. And so, uh, you know, I don't know when, when more documentation is going to come out, but, it, you know, it will come out, I think, over time um, as there, there is more dissent within the ranks of the Communist Party of China. And there actually ha ha there already has been some uh, discontent, um, you know, within among official circles in Xinjiang, and that's why these leaks already happened. So I'm, I'm just conjecturing that more of this is going to happen in the future. Great. Um, just to to expand on that a little bit, in terms of the exporting of this technology um, by China, you talk about Huawei. You talk about other, um, you know sort of the geopolitical considerations. Can you elaborate or at least just touch on what um, China's doing from an export perspective on, on um, putting surveillance technologies in other countries and who's taking them, who wants them, what some of the complexities are involved in that? Yes, yeah, so um, Chinese companies are eager to export their technologies. And this goes beyond just surveillance technologies, but you know, Huawei has emerged as a major supplier of smartphones and various components um, around the world, in particular in middle income countries, they're very popular. I actually, um, I used to have a Huawei phone for a little while when I was in, um, when I was living in Asia and the Middle East, I, you know, just out of curiosity, I, I wanted to buy this stuff and try it and, you know, kind of see what is it like if I were, you know, someone who uses these products, like what, what do these products do? And I wanted to kind of test them and see, you know, like, are, like, is there, are they surveilling me? I mean, is this, what is this app here? Um, you know, that's just what we journalists do. We're trying to kind of, you know, experience the things as people would experience them. Um, so, you know, Huawei is a major name um, and, you know, a lot of it's, uh, a lot of what it does around the world is, you know, I, I think it's just normal, um, you know, norm, the normal sales of normal technologies like smartphones that people use. But many of these Chinese uh, companies, you know, they do get wrapped up for both uh, profit purposes, but also the need to cooperate with uh, the Chinese government in, you know, exporting and selling, um, you know, major surveillance technologies and say camera technologies, AI surveillance technologies, facial recognition um, to mainly authoritarian nations that are contributing to the, or, or are involved in the Belt and Road um, program that I'm sure many in the audience have heard about. So, uh, you know, one example, I, I, got, I went through many examples in the book. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, Uzbekistan has been a major benefactor. Many of those Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, um, you know, some, some elements within their governments have, have deep connections to um, China and they, you know, they do actively purchase uh, these surveillance technologies with the intent of, of uh, you know, of, of 
watching their people and, and looking for ways to, you know, to oppress them better. Uh, I was actually reading a, a really just um, Orwellian article. It was in the Wall Street Journal a long time ago, but uh, someone in the government of Uzbekistan said that they they sought to use this Chinese technology to quote digitally manage political affairs, quote end quote. Um, you know, like this is the kind of thing that you come across, and you know, like when you're going. Uh, when you're looking across the world and looking at some of these, you know, kind of semi quasi authoritarian nations in places like Southeast Asia and uh, parts of Africa and South America that really depend on um, these kinds of, um, you know, these kinds of Chinese imported technologies, like you see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of official materials that kind of dodge the question or phrase it in a different way. They'll often say, you know, that, uh, that this technology is merely intended to, uh, you know, create a smart city, uh, you know, which in itself is, you know, a smart city or a safe city, like that's, that's a fine thing to do. And that's what, you know, that's what China has done for many countries that actually need to fight crime. But the problem is when, um, you know, these companies take it a step further with the connivance of the government to, um, you know, to actually set up like an authoritarian system that would benefit an authoritarian government somewhere. Great. An audience member asked, what's something that you learned that surprised you while writing this book? It's a great question. Yeah, good question. So the book was an endless. <laughs> and you froze. I feel like the best questions, right? When you're going to say something really exciting, it just freezes. Hey, Liesl? Yes. Hey, okay. Got me. Okay, up. start over. I didn't hear anything. You froze as soon as you started to answer. Okay, so um, so can you just repeat the question? Okay, what was I surprised question is, about? What's something that um, surprised you? What's something that you learned that surprised you while reading this book? Yeah. So the book was an endless series of surprises. Um, there was nothing in this book that seemed normal or anticipated or expected. Uh, and that was one of the just most fascinating things about, you know, just just writing it is that I've I've never I've I've written a lot of stories in my career so far, and I've never I've never written a story where it's like you go you start at a certain point and you just start going down the rabbit hole and everything gets weirder and darker and stranger, and by the end of the writing process, you know, you're just wondering, you know, what the heck just happened, and then you're like, like so, so I actually had to go back through a lot of my material and think about it again and just make sure that I understood what was really going on here because this, this surveillance state just, it became so bizarre over time. So, um, you know, specifically what surprised me? Well, I mean, you know, when I started writing the book, um, you know, I had booked a ticket out to Xinjiang, I was gonna fly there. Um, and then somehow the government of Cambodia where I have a long history obtained my flight information. Uh, I wasn't even in Cambodia, I wasn't flying from Cambodia and posted it all over the news and tried to make it tried to make me look like I was like a CIA spook going to overthrow China and they they like they used this evidence in, in the trial of their own opposition leader who was, was under house arrest and went to prison for a while um, you know I mean like that's just one example of something that I've had to you know grasp it with while writing the book and you know that's the thing is that if you know if the government of Cambodia which is a strong Chinese ally is you know doing this monitoring me in this way, like I just can't imagine how, uh, you know, a regular Uyghur person, you know, like either in the region or having left China is being surveilled just day in, day out. I mean, it's not just in China, but you know, that the Chinese agents, um, you know, Uyghur agents regularly call and harass and, and kind of cajole overseas Uyghur refugees trying to, to get them to come home or to um, you know, promising them to take care of their families back in the region if they become spies. I mean, just the level of intensity of surveillance, I, it just, it surprises me because I just, I, I still can't even wrap my head around how, you know, how there could be enough people in the entire nation of China to surveil so many people at such a deep level. Fascinating. I was curious to know how you decide, how what your process was for weaving all of these different stories together. It seemed like it would be very complicated because um, you kind of take these threads and, and braid them throughout the, the book. Do you, can you talk a little bit briefly about that before I ask the next 
question. Well, the, fir the first process is finding a good editor at a great publisher. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I do have to give great credit um, to my editor, uh, my publisher, you know, public affairs, because they did a great job of, you know, taking, taking drafts and elevating them to a level, you know, that would make me look smart, smarter than maybe I am. Um, so my publisher, you know, I, I think that weaving those stories together, they were extremely helpful. Um, but, you know, even, even before I was working with my publisher, I had spent a lot of time, uh, you know, just going, just, just trying to figure out the chronology of what exactly has happened here. I think that the chronology is the most challenging point of writing um, this kind of story because there are so many, um, you know, there are so many major social and geopolitical forces at play that go beyond the characters themselves that, you know, once you venture too far, far off in, in your narrative, um, the book can just become something else that you didn't really intend it to be. So I would say that it just comes down to really good planning, um, you know, lots, if there are any writers in the audience, you know, it's, it's just planning, um, it's, you know, not being satisfied with one draft with, you know, rewriting things, going back, um, you know, not accepting, you know, just kind of mediocre writing is something that, you know, is worthy of publishing. So it's hard work, but that's, that's really all it comes down to. Great. Uh, the next question from the audience is that many companies are facing scrutiny over their products being created with labor from the Xinjiang camps, and many have committed that they will not use materials created using human rights violations for their products. Does this type of economic divestment have an impact or place any pressure on the Chinese government? Um, it does. Yeah, it does. And I believe that um, the Chinese government, uh, especially its top officials, I think that they are um, terrified of having, you know, their, their supply chains, their assets, their, um, you know, their way, their way of doing business exposed and open out there in the world. There's been a lot of pushback um, from the Chinese government and, and various embassies against, you know, these kinds of stories. There have been lots of, you know, flat out denials and, and there's been lots of doublespeak coming from embassies about, you know, why this is, this is necessary and it develops, you know, the, the nation, it develops people economically and it gives them a good, a good life and prosperity. But essentially what they're doing is defending forced labor and, and potentially slave labor. Um, so, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, sanctions to a degree, I mean, I think that they work to a, de a degree when they're, um, when they're targeted, when they're effectively targeted. Um, I think that, uh, you know, our government, you know, I, I don't, I, I think that we have not actually begun to even scratch the surface when it comes to the potential of how far sanctions can go, because, even though many people have been exploring these supply chains, there are still many dark areas. Um, and it's not even uh, clear, uh, you know, just, just the nature of how our global supply chains work. We don't totally even understand them. I mean, I, I don't think we have, you know, we have lots of data on them, but, you know, when you go to a place like China, um, you know, a lot of that is a black box. And there have, you know, there have even been reports um, from the State Department now that supply chain auditors flying in from overseas to, you know, say represent a big company that's concerned about slave labor infecting its garments. They, they arrive in Xinjiang and they're detained by authorities and told, uh, you know, not to do this kind of work. So I think that there's, there, like, I think there are still many unknowns and I think that the scope of the problem is probably bigger than what we understand it to be now. That's traditional of a lot of data coming out of China. Um, this next question asks, can the U.S. claim a moral superiority here? The documentary 13th highlights the U.S. prison system of mass incarceration of Black men and women to use as prison slave labor with the expectation that prison is supposed to rehabilitate. Do you have any thoughts on this? Fine. Yeah, so of course, so, you know, the US um, also has a history of, you know, historical atrocities of, of slavery of, um, you know, the, uh, the, some of the atrocities against the Native Americans, um, which I, I see as a similar, a similar story of what's happening to the Uyghurs, you know, the, the displacement of uh, an indigenous minority group, um, you know, in efforts to kind of, um, you know, to, to turn them into Han Chinese or in you know, America's case to turn them into Protestant Christians and, and all that sort of thing. You know, I, um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned in that question a, a specific example, um, mass, you know, incarceration. So, um, so one of the things, you know, so there are differences, 
um, you know, there are stark differences between what's happening in America today and in China today. Um, you know, there is a race, there is an element of racial inequality, um, but the, um, the one of the biggest problems, I, I would say there are two big problems um, in China that are more magnified than what's been happening in America. And the first um, is the extent of the extra judi judicial um, concentration camp system. Um, so, you know, um, for, for whatever problems we have here, I mean, ultimately, um, you know, people are going through a system of courts, you know, there, there is a system set up um, of, of trying people and, you know, a jury that looks at them and that convicts them of crime. What's happening in uh, China is the, it, it is the completely uh, arbitrary based on, you know, technology systems that we don't understand, just the arbitrary um, detention and disappearance of, of 1.8 million people um, as an upper estimate. Uh, into concentration camps where, you know, I mean, they, they just simply, I mean, it's like they just disappear from the system. They're not, they're not being accused of a crime. They're not being tried for a crime. They're simply being told that you need to cleanse your mind. You need to cleanse your uh, viruses and you need to spend all these years uh, in a camp. Um, so the magnitude of that is just, uh, it's truly startling and terrifying. Um, the other thing uh, going, so this goes back to technology um, that I talked about before. There have been, you know, especially with the George Floyd protests, uh, there, there, have, there has been uh, a major um, discussion in our country over the role of various, say, predictive policing programs and algorithms and whether they discriminate against minorities more than, you know, they, uh, more than against whites and, and especially white men. Um, so, you know, that, like, that is happening on a much more massive extreme in, in China right now. Um, so first of all, the thing is that over there in Xinjiang, um, no one can have these discussions. No one can you know, ask the questions and say, well, wait a second, what, what kind of technology are you using and why does it discriminate so much against people from Muslim faiths and, and related ethnic backgrounds? Um, if they ask that question, then they're simply gonna go to a concentration camp. So. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, I think that there are some comparisons to be made, but um, you know, I think that what's happening, uh, you know, what's happening in this particular region of China is just it's it's an atrocity um, beyond the scale of you know I think what humanity has seen in a long time. Great. So, can you talk a little bit more about what you think the global response should be? You see calls for change from the private sector based on Uyghur forced labor, um, the United Nations has shown some movement, Human Rights Commission has shown some movement toward doing, conducting their own investigation. Um, obviously the United States State Department declared um, a genocide. What, is, in your view, should the international community be doing to address this issue? Um, and in particular, what should the response of the United States be? So, you know, this is something that always gets me because I think that, you know, like the international community often has limited power, um, you know, short of actually invading a country, which is completely off the table. Um, you know, limited authority, limited influence to, to really, you know, make these situations uh, change. I, I tend to think that changes, um, Changes in political systems, I tend to think, come from the inside first. I mean, I think that I, I do believe that there is discontent um, with the presidency of Xi Jinping in China, and I do think that you know there might be some kind of shift happening in, in the coming years. I don't know when that will happen, but I just I, I don't foresee this this personality cult continuing forever. Personality cults do tend to consume themselves, um, and it's just not something that you know can easily be kind of continued and built. So, you know, I, I think in the meantime, um, you know, as change, you know, as we wait for a, hopefully a hopeful change to happen in China and with its government, I think that in the meantime, um, you know, I think that targeted sanctions um, do work. And, you know, these are sanctions that target um, specific business interests that are employing slave labor um, that are that are essentially making it impossible for you know people who use slave labor to to sell their goods to the American market or the EU market. Um, you know I think that there is a lot to be said for you know making sure that markets uh, do reflect the values of democracy. You know I do I don't think that um, markets are separate from that. You know there are many people out there now who argue that you know with the trade wars we should keep trade and human rights separate. But um, you know I think that 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 uh, 
you know, protecting the market and protecting it from being corrupted uh, more than it already is really means, you know, ensuring that it, you know, that the way the market is structured reflects the, the ideas and the vision of, a, you know, a democratic society. Um, so sanctions, um, you know, I, I think that they work to an extent. Um, I also think that, uh, I, I mentioned this before, but, you know, many um, Chinese elites are uh, quite scared of their assets being um, revealed and exposed overseas. I think that we also have a, um, in, in America and just generally in the world, I think that we have a weak anti-money laundering uh, regime. I think that it's it's very easy to launder money, um, you know, through various Caribbean islands and, you know, through Bitcoin. And I think that finding ways also in the U.S. state of Delaware is a major laundering uh, concern. Um, I think that, you know, finding ways to just make the market more transparent, to, to make sure that we have good data and more data on where the financial flows are going from, you know, from places like Xinjiang and also other, you know, human rights abusing um, entities, just, just being able to see where they put their money and where it flows and then looking for ways to act against it or to, to block it or even to freeze it, uh, to seize it. I think that these are all, um, you know, effective tools in at least advancing causes of human rights. Do you, another audience member asks if you, um, if there are any leaders fighting for human rights in Xinjiang? There were, um, not so much anymore to my knowledge. I think that the region has pretty much been cleansed, so to speak, of dissent. Um, I don't think that anyone there can, can stand up and uh, lead any protests, any kind of, any kind of mass gathering anymore. I just think it's, it's, We lost you again. I just, um, Jeff, we lost you, sorry. Hey, Liesl? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry about that. I don't know what's going on with my connection today. It's just acting funny on the day that we have a talk. Together. Always, always on That's the always important happens. days, yes. And the most yeah. important question. So you were saying that there aren't any human rights leaders in um, Xinjiang anymore, but there used to be, but I, I think we, you got cut off there. Yes. So in the book, I document uh, one of the major stories of a, um, a famous activist and scholar named Ilham Toti, who has been sentenced to prison in China. He is now ser serving a sentence, uh, I, I, I believe, the sentence has changed once in a while, but I think it's a life sentence now. And you know, he's it's it's just a terrible situation for him. But this is an example. Um, Ilham Toti is just a man who is deeply respected among the Uyghur community. Who you know, people even here in Washington D.C. Um, remember him and talk about him and talk about what um, what a great figure he was. So he was someone who um, you know, far from being. Uh, you know, far from being, um, you know, kind of a, a violent or like an extreme figure who wanted to fight the Chinese state and establish, you know, his own state, he favored a path towards moderation. Um, you know, he was more like a Nelson Mandela type figure, and he he often uh, held students at his. He would bring Uyghur students and other students to his classes in Beijing on the weekends, and he would, you know, tell them stories about how nations are built and how nations are formed and the importance of having. Um, you know, minorities and the various groups that, um, you know, that, that understand each other, that respect each other, that all see themselves as, you know, one part of a, a bigger whole. Um, and, you know, he would talk about various figures like this, you know, in Asia, but also he would talk about people like Nelson Mandela and, you know, some of the major social movements of the post-Cold War world. Um, and because of this, he was, um, he was tried for sedition. He was just arrested one day. And um, the Chinese government just um, sentenced him. And, you know, he's now, he, he would be, I think, the best example of um, a major activist who, you know, had a great following and a great cause who has been kind of removed from the scene. And I think it was a strategic, you know, attack by the Chinese government because I think they realized that so many um, Uyghurs just re so deeply respected him and wanted him to be their leader. Um, but that, just, just to clarify that, um, from I, I've spoken with a lot of his family members and, and old friends, and they all say that he actually did not want to be a leader. He was, you know, he was a pretty simple man. He enjoyed um, the intellectual life. He wanted to, uh, you know, read books and talk about history. He did not 
want to you know rise up and become this Mandela figure for the Uyghurs. But that's sort of how the Chinese state saw him and feared what he would become. So you know he's someone who I just I just hope that he's being treated with some kind of dignity um, in that prison over there. I, I'm not too hopeful, but I, I just hope that you know he will one day get out and be able to you know to to return to his old life. Great. Well, we are um, a little bit over time. So I wanted to quickly ask you, so if people read this book, um, they start to pay attention to these technologies. What should the average American who reads this, who uses US technologies that are amplifying information that might not be true or that you know they question whether or not it's true, what should they do? How can they help? What, how should they respond to um, this? the situation and to, to your book in particular. You mean to, uh, to, to helping the cause to improve yeah. the lives if of people? They, if they read it, it's great to be informed, but if they think, okay, so what do I do now? Um, do you have any thoughts on, on how people can be involved? So there are numerous um, excellent groups um, all over America, out in DC and also in Europe, um, in places like Norway, uh, also in Turkey that um, exists to help uh, Uyghur refugees and refugees from other groups. Um, and you know, what they do, they, they, they'll help them you know, kind of undercover, they'll help them find ways to escape this region as much as it might be impossible anymore. Um, but once they do arrive, uh, you know, the, the Uyghurs do suffer a great deal of psychological um, you know, anguish and, and torment, and you know, they often have to rebuild their lives so you know there there are many groups that help Uyghurs get through these tribulations that help them you know that give them therapy that you know help them kind of transition and you know I, I think that volunteering for one of these groups or giving them a donation is always helpful. There's the there's the Uyghur Human Rights Project here in D.C. They um, do great investigations into this topic. Um, there's a group called Uyghur Help out in Norway and uh, they do a lot to um, you know, to, to kind of help people rehabilitate into, you know, into society. Um, and also there are, um, there is a new group and I wish I could, I, I don't recall the name now, but um, I, I could, if anyone's interested and, you know, can email me later. Um, there is a new group that's actually working specifically on mental um, health issues for Uyghurs arriving in America. And I think that's the most important part that's been neglected so far. And that's the, I think that's the area that's going to start growing in significance in the coming years. Yeah, your description of um, Mason's mental health progression was really fascinating in the book. I thought it was really interesting to see the impact that had on her psychology um, and her response to it. So thank you so much for all of this. Um, for those of you who are still on, the um, Perfect Police State can be purchased at the link in the chat. Uh, thank you all for attending and for your great questions. Jeff, thank you for your work and for um, writing this great book. And Angela and New America, thank you for all of your work and Alina, for all of your help with this um, with this effort. We really appreciate your attendance and for making the time. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Liesl.